Well, welcome to Laoya in sunny Spain. As you can see, it's quite a sunny day. And we're going to go to Elche today. We are. We're going to do the palm route. Walk around the palm parks that are very famous. It's a lovely historic centre. Um, several of you who have visited have been there before. Uh, we're going to have a look at the basilica. We're going to have a look at the town centre. We're going to go into the ornamental park. And as Julie says, we're going to have a walk around the palm parks. And I've even got my Elche Club de Football shot shirt on as well. Mucho Elche, mucho Elche. Well, I was born one morning, rain come pouring down. I heard my mama sit on my papa, let's call him John. Walk on, boy. Yeah. Walk on, boy. Walk on down the road. Ain't no, no one in this wide world gonna help, help you, you carry, carry your load. Walk on, boy. Yeah. Walk on, boy. Walk on down the road. No one in Stanley. Well, we're on the way to Elche, so we're going a different direction to last time, and uh, we've got different technology with us. I've got, uh, well, we've both got, um, is it called Lavalier or? Lavalier microphones. Well, I can't pronounce either, so I have no idea. Because you don't call the Vauxhall Cavalier a Vauxhall Cavalier, do you? When I was looking online, they, they called them lav mics. Now, I think there's an important warning in that, isn't there? <laughs> I'm saying nothing to that. Because actually... We're not going into toilet humour. Well, the important thing with a lav mic is to turn it off. <laughs> That's yes. important, isn't it? <laughs> Otherwise, especially if you're being recorded. Well, a lot of people ask us, if it's Elche, why is it ELX? Do you know why? Because ELX is Valencian. It is indeed. Um, we're about the southernmost, almost the southernmost uh, enclave of the Valenciano language. Some English residents of the local area uh, insist on pronouncing it Elche. And in fact, frequent watchers of the football Spanish version might also call it Elche. I'm not an expert but it certainly isn't Elche. It's something like Elche. Elche. There's a sort of a TCH there, isn't there? I believe so. Well, we're not driving into Elche, Julie. Is there a problem? Yes. Well, let's have a look. Let's um, have a look at the car. We have a burst. A badly burst tyre. Oh dear, oh my. So this might slow us down just a little bit. You think? Just a tad. <laughs> So we've arrived in the centre of Elche now. With the Palacio de Altamira. Mm. 
which is now part of a museum. So if you go into the main museum here, you come out into the castle. Well, it is, and the museum is actually open today, we've uh, just seen. Um, and then as you sweep round, you get a nice, well, you don't quite see the Basilica, do you? But it's, uh, you, can see, you can see its hat. You can see its blue hat. You can see the main tower of the Basilica first. You can indeed. So let's go and have a look at the square then. We have climbed up the Basilica steps to the top of that tower. Hang on. We have been to the top of that tower and looked out. Yeah. It's several hundreds of steps. It's more than 39 then? Yes, just slightly. And we're walking actually in the right in the centre of Elche where a lot of the festivities take place which of course they won't be again this year as indeed they didn't last year all the different parades it's very quiet for a Saturday because all the restaurants and bars are shut this statue in front of us is dedicated to famous women it's this statue of the world And so we're entering the public municipal park in Elche. Really is quite remarkable the amount of uh, species of palms that we've got in here, isn't it really? They're really quite amazing. We also have some of the cacti we have in our garden in here. We've got a few more palm trees than we've got. Yes, but our cacti is nearly as big as that one. It's a shame the children's play area is fenced off, isn't it, actually? Because usually this is a, a real hive of activity. Yes, it's very sad. Except some of it is and some of it isn't, by the looks of it. I think some of it's... Or maybe... Maybe people have just interpreted the rules <laughs> differently. Well, there's so much to see in this park, um, but we have probably haven't got a great deal of time today. Do you remember when we came and watched the, the concert in the middle of the park in the, the theatre bit? I did. So we watched the three tenors and it didn't start till 10 o'clock at night and everybody brought picnics. Well, there's a series... Because it was so hot. Yeah, there's a series of festivals and and uh, fiestas that um, culturally centre on Elche, isn't there, right the way through the year? Yes, yes, I mean the main fiesta is in August, 
when yeah. it's very hot and they make paella in the middle of the road. Yeah. How many is that for again? About 4,000 people, 4,500 <laughs> people get fed. That's amazing. It is huge. Yeah. Absolutely, they use a crane to put the big brick. Yeah. To get the cost of the, the hot brick. It's amazing. I like the guitar festival as well. That's the... So yeah, it's not just the park, is it? There's um, all sorts of things in Elche that make it the city that it is, really. We need to get a move on okay. um, before the weather changes. Maybe. Well, we're on walking on Ruta del Palmeiras, or Ruta Palmeiras. The Ruta, palm walk. The palm walk, in fact. Um, wonderful that so many of these fantastic palm trees are virtually in the city centre, because Elche is famous for its palms, isn't it? Yes, they're between 250,000 and half a million palm trees all in the city centre and it's been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site which is quite exciting. Yeah it has and it's not just it's not just because of the palms themselves which is fairly spectacular as you can see all around us it's also the history of the communities as well because Elche well it's an old Roman well it's before Roman times in fact but the first title of the of the city was Elice, which was Roman, and then it became Elche, and uh, and then it had a a strong history in the Islamic um, era in Spain, and there was a time when um, Muslims, Jews, and Christians lived relatively peacefully in this city, and the city owes a lot to the different pieces of heritage of each community, which is great. And in fact, the palms themselves came across from North Africa. And there's quite a few of them, as you can see. Yes. Multiple species. Yeah, I get confused by... A lot of them are date palms, but not all of them, are they really? Was, the other ones are Washingtonia. Yeah. Well, most of these are dates around this area looking. They are actually. Because there's some dates that haven't been harvested right up the tree up there. If you scan up there, right up there to the top. Um, yeah, I can't really see them actually. Okay. Yeah, it's lovely to be able to be in the countryside but be in the city at the same time actually, which is, uh, which is what we've got. We're going to go into Art. De la Mareta. Um, and, uh, and this is where you can see here yeah. that date palms are not trees. They're little bushes and things that eventually, when you cut the fronds off, and from here you can see the layers. If you cut the fronds off, it makes, it makes the trunk to the fronds but they're not naturally called a tree. I used to like the fronds when he was in Happy Days. <laughs> that was a, one of the favourite TV programmes of mm. mine. But these ones here definitely need pruning, whereas these... They do. These have been pruned. Yeah, looking up a bit. Um, they're last those, year's those, dates. Those are last year's dates that... Uh, and to have a date last year is just uh, so last year really, isn't it? But yeah, the reason I was able to do that, I'll let Julie walk down here first, because I'm We're going to walk into carrying the, the camera on the end of a big stick, and the stick is actually a monopod that used to belong to your dad, Julie, didn't it? Yes. When my dad retired, he took up videoing, as he called it. Then, so he took up... So we are talking 35 years ago now, mm. so um, yes, because he would have been 90 this year, was it last yeah. year even? Anyway, um, last year he'd have been 90, 
So we're talking 35 years ago, he retired and he took up videoing and he had this monopod thing as part of his videoing kit, which we inherited. Right. While the video camera is big and clunky and very old, some of the other attachments still are useful. Yeah, it, well, it's actually rather nice for him to be, you know, we're on the journey with us, really. And, um, and the same can be said for my dad as well, because um, it's quite heavy to hold this thing. And I'm holding it in a, like a holster thing, for want of a better word, um, with a, a belt around, as you can see on my shoulder. And it's actually the one that's intended for use with the, the flag and standard of the Burma Star Association, of which my father was a member because he spent time in Burma, in the Burma campaign in the Second World War. And so, 70 years after the Burma Star Association was founded, 75 years after the Burma campaign finished, several years after both our fathers have passed away they're um yeah we remember them yeah we remember them and it's nice it's nice to uh, have them with us on the journey they would have liked to come to spain they would what I'm would your dad have enjoyed about it do you think sitting by the pool yeah. listening to the birds definitely the countryside the mountains and then sitting on the beach with a cup of tea. He'd have had to have a cup of tea still. Or a beer. Or a whiskey as well, possibly. He wouldn't have had a wh whiskey down the beach. That's a night time. <laughs> <laughs> but a beer, yeah. sitting on the beach with a beer would have been nice. So you haven't got your father physically with you. What did you learn from him, do you think? Oh. That's, a, that's a big question, isn't it? What, oh. did, what did you learn from your father? Uh, my first memory of learning anything, I reckon, was learning how at the age two to bend copper pipe. <laughs> <laughs> now, not many people would have expected you to say that. Well, he was a plumber and we yeah. were one of the first houses to have central heating put in because that was his job okay. in the late 60s. And he put this coil spring down pipe and would bend it. And so I used to go and help him in the garage bend, try and bend this pipe. I mean, whether I have a managed to bend it myself but he used to pretend I did yeah. so I remember bending copper pipe. I have to say that you've always worked well with um, the plumbers that have been in our house and you've always <laughs> known what techniques to talk to them about and uh, and if they've been saying to you Ooh, I don't know about that um, you've been suggesting other ways of doing it which is which is rather good. Yeah. But what did you what did you really learn from him though? Um, it, yes, you can have that one, but it's a bit of a deaf one, really. Okay. What else did I learn from my dad? I don't know if what you'd call it the if things go wrong, get back up and fight it. How would you call it? Facing um, your fears. How some do you... would some would call it bounce back ability, but facing your fears is probably better, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. When I crashed my car when I was 18, badly. Um, it was the first year seatbelt laws came in and it's a good job they had because I would have been dead and we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, That's very true. So I wrote my car off and was very, very fearful and it was a little red mini. The week after I came out of hospital he insisted that I got in his big car which was a great big brown Humber Scepter, mm -hmm. like a tank with no power steering those days. And I was only about six stone wet through and he made me get in every day for a week and drive his car so that I didn't fear driving because I was frightened to drive after having the accident so wow. and he taught me yes he definitely taught me if you face your fears that's good because the longer you don't face them the bigger they grow so have a go at least that's a good lesson
Oh, have a nice sit down. I've got a surprise for you. Oh, that's good. That's exciting. Apart from water, which we need. Oh, yeah, we. I packed. Yeah. Some date cake. Oh, excellent. Well, I suppose <laughs> it's appropriate. It's appropriate for Look, when you're in pound season, isn't it? Really? But, but it's homemade in our my new bread making machine. Okay, you might have to go and show it to the cameraman. Because he's not can he, can he not see from here? Uh, he he can't, can't see very much if you, go, oh. if you go and show it to him. Oops, dropped my mask. So we have date and walnut cake that I made. So there you are. Tasty, thank you. Can you can have a piece of date and walnut cake. Do you know, I always thought date and walnut cake was from a place called Dayton. I no. actually did. I actually did. <laughs> oh dear. I haven't just said that. It's one of those, it's one of those things talking with your mouthful now. Just I eat am, it quick. I'm talking with your mouthful. Um, I asked you what you learned from your dad. What I learned last week was YouTube puts automatic subtitles on and it, that it takes from the voice recognition. Mm -hmm. So, but it couldn't cope with some of the, the accents that I've got and you've got. I also saw some of the words. So, tobacco, what was that? Tobacco. That was tobacco. Tobacco was tobacco. Um, the man running with a, a mask on became the man running with a mascot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had visions of, uh, of like a man running next to a Wookiee during the London Marathon from Four Lions or something. So anyway, so man running with a mascot. Mm. We had Fanta Cola instead of Santa Paula, <laughs> which, which could be useful if you it's like Fanta thirsty. and Cola. Yeah, because Fanta and Cola must be in the, the database. Must. So, Fanta Cola. And the best one was Ballet Eric's. Was Ballet Eric's. B A L L E T E R I C S. Ballet Eric. Ballet Eric's was Ballet Eric's. And I thought that's that. Sort of like, this is beautiful. Dayton Walnut Cake. Mm. From Dayton the Beach. My mother taught me to make this. See, we haven't mentioned mothers this week. Well, you mentioned my, my mother, mother My mother taught me to make cakes, really. My mother's a cake maker. Mm. So, but I have butter on mine because we traditionally had it with butter on, but you don't like butter, so. Okay. Mm. Well, it's a useful mm. um, pick-me-up when, we, um, when we're working so hard walking through the palm walks of Elche. Mm. And it might be a bit high to go and pick some dates, but, uh, but it's just quite appropriate. But this date walnut cake is from our tree dates. Whoa! So these are homemade, homegrown dates in my date and walnut cake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you? What did your dad teach you? Uh, oh, <laughs> that's, that's touche, I suppose. It's a, yeah. If I have, oh, I need to stop and think about that. Um, I think he taught me how to be sociable. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean that. Uh, I'm I, not saying anything. <laughs> no, not really. It was when my when dad famously said to my mother, um, I only drink to be sociable. To which my mother replied very, very quickly, well, it doesn't work then, does it? <laughs> <laughs> which I think I quoted that at my dad's funeral, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that's a silly one. Um, he, had a, he had a tough childhood, my dad. He lost his mum when he was four. He um, had a rough time in his teens. Very rough time. And he volunteered to get in the army as soon as he could and he was in the second world war all the time it was on um, even into extra time as it were and was away from the UK the whole time and went through quite a few 
stories that he didn't really embellish, unlike some people possibly, but, um, but what did I learn from him? Um, well, as a dad, he was always brilliant, um, working hard, quite chirpy at one level and then angry about something at the next level. But I think it's his resilience. I think it's this, you keep going, you don't let things grind you down. Um, you get on with it, you do the job. He never claimed to be brilliantly practical, but he, but he never really liked doing it and complained about it, but he did it. And um, that, uh, that resilience, yeah, keeping going when, okay. um, when things, quite a few people would have gone through what he's gone through and they'd passed it, they would pass it down to other people and he didn't and I uh, will forever respect and love him for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we've come to a quiet spot on our walk now and I've managed to take my mask off and get a bit of fresh air. And uh, it's been great to have you with us. We're almost, we're almost finished and uh, just a few metres before we go, start making our way back home. Hopefully the, the tyre on the car is not going to burst again uh, on the way home. Uh, but uh, thank you for joining us and thank you, um, not just Julie and I, but we've been thinking about our dads with us today, actually, with the with the monopod and the um, the holster that, that that my dad had as well. And um, I remember one of the stories that my dad had. He spent time in the Middle East during the war, and he finished up in Nazareth. And he once he got to Nazareth, he uh, he and he wasn't a religious man, my father at all. It, uh, he never went to church and he, he didn't really have that uh, religious jargon that people use at all. But he said, when I got to Nazareth, there was a dusty main street. I'm sure it's not like that today. And, and what he said is basically, I thought what I'll do is I will walk with one foot in front of the other, one foot touching the other. And I'll walk right away across the road. He probably did it without wobbling like I am and once he got fast motion once he got the other side of the road he um, he came back and he went the other way putting one foot in front of the other and and what he said to me was that basically I knew um, once I'd done that that I'd walked where he walked and I found that really profound, um, that my father, who obviously understood the mystery of faith, um, but didn't really express it in a tangible way, but he was able to say, uh, I'd walked in the feet, walked in the footsteps on the same road that, that he walked. And last week we talked about a quote from Justin Welby of, um, sharing the journey of Lent with Jesus. And I suppose that's taking it one step further, is if we follow the footsteps of Christ as well. And if we let that inform us in our journey through this complicated world.
Where are we going next? Create them. We have a choice. Okay. We could go to the bird reserve. Yeah. Or we could go up to the now what do they call it? The dam, which is the Pantano. Pan Pantano, yeah. Mm. The Pantano of Elche. Okay. I think there are two choices. It so will we depend, won't be... depend on the weather. We won't be back to the seaside again then, will we? No, the week after maybe. We must admit because the weather's been changeable today. <coughs> no, it hasn't. <laughs> it's only 17 and a half degrees. Yeah. Hashtag blessed. No, can't say that. <laughs> <laughs>